One of the most central themes of Philip K. Dick's novel, The Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, one that we also don't see really reflected that much in the film adaptation, The Blade Runner, at least with the same amount of importance, is that of empathy. And empathy can be felt <clears throat> towards a number of different beings, humans, fellow humans, right? It can be felt towards animals, as we see, very importantly. And it could also be felt towards androids. That is a question that comes up in a very important way later in the novel when Deckard himself begins feeling empathetic towards at least certain androids, which presents a major problem since he is a bounty hunter who is supposed to be killing androids or retiring them, taking them out of the uh, life process, you could say. And <clears throat> empathy is one of the dividing lines between human beings and androids in that androids are not supposed to be able to grasp or have the capacity for empathy. It's a little bit trickier as we're going to see. But so empathy is considered to be distinctively human, and it is exhibited clearly by most human beings who are not institutionalized towards animals and towards their fellow human beings. Although we have to be kind of careful with this, you know, think about the very beginning of the novel where, uh, where you know, Deckard and, and uh, his wife are going to have an argument and he's about to dial up his mood and she says, you add more venom, I'll add more venom. These are not particularly <laughs> empathetic responses towards each other, but we do see that they exhibit empathy towards each other later on in uh, the novel. And, you know, some other human beings do as well. They display um, other emotions too. And in a very interesting um, sort of interior monologue that Dick leads us through, Rick Deckard speculates about the nature of empathy, this empathetic gift. So he tells us the empathetic gift blurs the boundaries between hunter and victim, between the successful and the defeated. And he says two really interesting things that give us an idea about what empathy looks like. Um, he says, oddly, it resembled a sort of biological insurance, but double-edged. As long as some creature experienced joy, then the condition for all other creatures included a fragment of joy. However, if any living being suffered, then for all the rest, the shadow could not be entirely cast off. And so for social animals, or as he's calling it here, a herd animals such as human beings, we share in each other's joys and pains in happiness and misery. And we feel towards each other, perhaps not you know, exactly what the other person feels, but it affects us. And you might think, you know, just to go off on a little tangent here, uh, if you know your moral philosophy, you might think about Aristotle and his discussion of friendship in Nicomachean Ethics, Book 9, where he says that friends share joys and sorrows with each other, or griefs, literally. Or you might think of Jeremy Bentham and his discussion of um, sympathy and uh, you know how that works out, or benevolence in, in terms of feeling something good about somebody else feeling good, feeling bad about somebody else feeling something bad. In any case, Deckard suggests that empathy makes sense for um, human beings, right? He says empathy evidently existed only within the human community, whereas intelligence to some degree could be found throughout every phylum and order, including the arachnida, the spiders and things like that. Why? The empathetic faculty probably required an unimpaired group instinct. A solitary organism such as a spider would have no use for it. In fact, it would tend to abort a spider's ability to survive. It would make him conscious of the desire to live on the part of his prey. So predators would not have um, empathy, including highly developed mammals such as cats. And, um, you know, so where do, where do androids fit in with this. He says, evidently the humanoid robot constituted a solitary predator. And we see in the next line, Rick liked to think of them that way. It made his job palatable 
in retiring, that is killing an Andy. He did not violate the rule of life laid down by Mercer. You shall kill only the killers. So this is in some ways providing us with a, not, you know, the definitive position on empathy, but something that's nice for Descartes to think so that he can make it through the day. Now, Androids in the story clearly lack empathy for animals. They don't relate to animals in the way that human beings do. And remember that we're talking about a future in which animals have become rare and valued and in which mercerism has uh, helped human beings to become much more empathetic. And so this is something that's, that's really distinctive. That's why the Voigt-Kampf test tests uh, reactions to, you know, uh, things that are happening to animals. Or uh, androids also seem to lack empathy for humans. They can relate to humans. They can be interested in them. They can form connections with them. But they don't have the empathetic response. And it's interesting because they also lack that in relation to other androids. They can have friendships as, you know, the Beatties and Pris and, um, you know, the other members of that crew seem to have. They can have a kind of, uh, you know, group identification, but they're ultimately on their own. And we get to see that it's not so simple as just one stance. There's several different possibilities. So in chapter 11, we see uh, Inspector Garland, who is himself an android. This is at the fake police station. Um, and he's talking about what um, uh, Phil Resch, the bounty hunter who's working at this, this fake police station at the Hall of Justice, um, how he's going to react. Because at that point in the novel, we're not sure whether Phil Resch himself is an android or whether just Garland is and some of the other cops in the, the place. We're not even sure, actually. There's been some hinting that maybe Deckard himself could be an android, although that's, that's dismissed fairly quickly. <clears throat> and so Inspector Garland says, you know, it's too bad that you know, we couldn't just sort of like leave things alone. Uh, he says, your position would be better if Phil Resch could pass this test if it was just me. The results that way would be predictable to Resch. I'd be just another Andy to retire as soon as possible. So you're not in a good position, you know. And um, then he explains things and he says, here comes the eager beaver, Phil Resch, back with his handy dandy portable little test. Isn't he clever? He's gonna destroy his own life and mine and possibly yours. Now, this is cognitively understood, but it's not as if Garland cares about that, right? And Rick says, you androids don't exactly cover for each other in times of stress. And Garland says back to him, I think you're right. It would seem that we lack a specific talent you humans possess. I believe it is called empathy. And so there's a recognition that they, they don't have that. Um, later on in Isidore's apartment, Roy Beatty says something quite interesting. The question is, well, um, should Isidore turn them in or are they in danger of that? And Irmagard Beatty says, um, I don't think we have to worry about Mr. Isidore. They don't treat him very well either, as he said, and what we did on Mars, he isn't interested in. He knows us and he likes us and an emotional acceptance like that, it's everything to him. It's hard for us to grasp, but it's true. So this emotional acceptance of Pris and the two babies, right? And she says uh, to Isidore, you could get a lot of money by turning us in. Do you realize that? And then she says to Roy, see, he realizes that, but he still wouldn't say anything. And Roy says, if he was an android, he'd turn us in about 10 tomorrow morning. He'd take off for his job, and that would be it. I'm overwhelmed with imagination. And we, we or admiration. And we imagine this would be a friendless world, a planet of hostile faces all turned against us. And, um, you know, there's a recognition here that Isidore at least is behaving in an empathetic manner towards them, even though they don't have that. When we get to Rachel Rosen in chapter 16, things are a bit more complicated. 
And she turns out to be kind of a linchpin in, in the, the narrative that's going on. So she is talking about Pris, and Pris is, is made on the same model, you could say, as Rachel. And that's what, what's going to make it difficult for Deckard to retire Pris, because he's attracted to and even empathetically connected with Rachel. So she goes on and um, she says, do you know what I have towards this Pris android? And Deckard says, empathy. And she doesn't say yes. She says something like that. Identification. There goes I. My God, maybe that's what'll happen in the confusion. You'll retire me, not her. She can go back to Seattle and live my life. I never felt this way before. We are machines stamped out like bottle caps. It's an illusion that I, I personally really exist. I'm just representative of a type. And he points out, well, ants don't feel like that and they're physically identical. And then she says, ants don't feel period. And then he says, well, identif identical human twins, they don't. And she says, but they identify with each other. I understand that they have an empathetic special bond. And so a little bit later she says, um, if I die, maybe I'll be born again when the Rosen Association stamps out its next unit of my subtype. So this is quite interesting. She um, has some sort of connection towards Pris, but it's, it's not exactly empathy. As a matter of fact, it might, be, it might even be viewed as hatred or antipathy, a view that um, the other is a rival to her, that the other would take over her pretty cush, posh life and no longer be an android on the run. There's a question as well whether androids feel any loyalty towards each other in any significant way. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of an open issue, right? So loyalty, can she feel it towards him or not? We don't really know. So we've got the possibility of non-empathy or even antipathy towards fellow androids. Now, what about humans towards androids? So we have these two bounty hunters, and it turns out that, that Phil Resch is, in fact, human. He's just been working at this fake Hall of Justice, and it's kind of unclear how exactly that happened. Dick doesn't tell us. But Rick Deckard and, and Phil Resch, they have rival uh, tests for telling the androids apart. They um, both have been hunting androids and successfully retiring them, it's going to turn out that they have another connection in common as well. And they go off to kill the opera singer android, uh, Luba Luft, and uh, it ends up being, you know, uh, Resh who, who does it. And they take these, these uh, you know, tests and figure out who's who. And then Deckard um, has an interesting idea. He's kind of concerned with what is actually um, going on. Turns out that he has developed empathy. And so here's the, the passage. It's in uh, chapter 12. So he says, uh, this is Phil Rush. Do you have your ideology framed that would explain me as a part of the human race? And Rick says, there is a defect in your empathetic role-taking ability one which we don't test for, your feelings towards androids. <clears throat> so Rush has, you know, the right kind of empathy towards animals. He's actually got a pet squirrel. Uh, he's pretty empathetic towards humans, although Deckard says, you know, I think you just like killing and you'd be happy to find out that I'm an android so you'd have an excuse to kill me. So he's not all that empathetic towards, towards human beings. But he definitely doesn't have empathy towards androids. He has the opposite. And uh, uh, Resch says, well, we don't test for that. And uh, Deckard says, maybe we should. He never thought of it before. Had, he never felt any empathy on his own part towards the androids he killed. Always he'd assumed that throughout his psyche, he experienced the android as a clever machine, as in his conscious view. 
And yet, in contrast to Phil Resch, a difference had manifested itself, <clears throat> and he felt instinctively that he was right. Empathy towards an artificial construct, he asked himself, something that only pretends to be alive, but Luba Luft had seemed genuinely alive. It had not worn the aspect of a simulation. And then Resch goes on and says, listen, buddy, this would be a terrible thing. Um, you realize what this would do if we included androids in our range of empathetic identification as we do animals, we couldn't protect ourselves. These Nexus 6 types, they'd roll all over us and mash us flat. You and I, all the bounty hunters, we stand between the Nexus 6 and mankind, <clears throat> a barrier that keeps the two distinct. And then Rick says, yeah, okay, I, I, you know, I get that. I want to ask myself a question with the Voight camp test. And so he, he does that, and he has um, Resch you know, observe it so that, that he can process it. And he, um, here it is. I'm going down by elevator with an android I've captured, and suddenly someone kills it without warning. No particular response, Phil Resch said. What did the needles hit? And then Rick says, a female android. And then the needles go wild. And then Rick says... That's an emphatically empathetic response about what a human subject shows for most questions, except for the extreme ones, the truly pathological ones. And, and Resch says, well, what does that mean? And Descart says, I'm capable of feeling empathy for at least specific certain androids. Not all of them, but one or two. For Lobo Luft, as an example, he said to himself. And then he says, so I was wrong. There's nothing unnatural or unhuman about Phil Resch's reactions. It's me. And he says, I wonder if any human has ever felt this way about an android. And Resch says, you know, you're in a spot, Deckard. And <clears throat> Deckard says, well, what should I do? And Resch says, it's sex. Sex? Because she, it was physically attractive. Hasn't that ever happened to you before? We were taught it constitutes a prime problem in Bounty Hunter. And they talk about android mistresses. And so, you know, maybe this can be just localized. But... We find later on in chapter 15, when Rick is talking to his wife, Erin, <clears throat> he says, I want to talk about what happened to me today. I met another bounty hunter, one I never saw before, a predatory one who seemed to like to destroy them. For the first time after being with him, I looked at them differently. I mean, in my own way, I had been viewing them as he did. And he says, I took a test, one question, and verified it. I've begun to empathize with androids. And look at what that means. You said it this morning yourself, those poor Andes. So you know what I'm talking about. So not only um, does Descartes feel something towards or about these androids, his wife does too, which means that probably a lot of people do in some way. But this is going to get right in the way of being a bounty hunter. Resch, on the other hand, enjoys the killing, right? He feels antipathy towards the androids, um, or at least he feels perhaps nothing towards them. Now, what brings the two of them together? As we find out in the sort of vignette, the scenes with Rachel Rosen, she has actually been um, playing. Deckard. There's a whole backstory there. And um, she, had, you know, at first says, well, you know, I'll help you with the androids. I'll kill Pris for you. You know, they have sex. And then there is this thing where he says, if you weren't an android, I could legally marry you. I would. And they, they talk about that. And then Rachel says, you look so sad. Putting his hand out, he touched her cheek. And then she says, you're not going to be able to hunt androids any longer. So don't look sad, please. <clears throat> and then she goes on explaining what, what the case actually is. No bounty hunter has ever gone on after being with me except one, a very cynical man, Phil Resch, and he's nutty. He works out in left field on his own. I see, Rick said. He felt numb completely throughout his entire body. And then she, she talks about, you know, um, knowing the babies and knowing all of these other androids. And she goes on and says, um, 
you know, we've been uh, catching up with, with bounty hunters. The association wanted to reach the bounty hunters here and in the Soviet Union. This seemed to work for reasons which we do not fully understand, our limitation again. So she's able to use sex and attraction to spark empathy in these bounty hunters that will go beyond merely her and get these bounty hunters to feel empathy towards androids more generally so that they can't keep doing their job killing androids. And so she says, um, I, or he says, I doubt if it works as often or as well as you say. And she says, but it has with you. And he says, we'll see. And she says, I already know when I saw that expression on your face, that grief, I look for that. And he asks, how many times have you done this? I don't remember. Seven, eight? No, I believe it's nine. Yes, nine times. And so, you know, this is a, a very interesting scene. I mean, does she actually remember this, this process that she's gone through? Have her memories been erased and replaced? Um, you know, how does she know that Deckard isn't going to be able to go through with killing more androids after, after her, or at, rather after he is done with this massive job? Um, it's <coughs> through looking at his face. Something like what we would call emotional intelligence, being able to tell what the emotions of other people are. And yet, if she doesn't have an empathetic connection, could she be right about this? There's a lot of interesting questions that are being raised here. And so we've got you know, the possibility of empathy towards androids. Androids don't themselves feel it towards each other, but human beings can be brought to feel it. We've also got the possibility of shifting over to the other side. Perhaps Phil Resch felt that he was tricked and you know, she mentions him as cynical, so maybe he uh, viewed this as manipulative, which it certainly is, and then uh, heads over to the side of antipathy towards them as well. So there's a wide range of, of possible human reactions to androids and only one or at least one set of reactions that don't include empathy between androids themselves. 